Let's talk about the DJI Phantom 4. Now I've made a few other videos about this drone, but I want to do a little bit more of a comprehensive overview of all the different pieces and my thoughts on flying it. Now I'm not going to be flying it in here, but I'll make sure to include a couple shots that I've taken with the Phantom 4 directly from the camera on here. Probably we'll do the raw, ungraded, just right out of the camera, what it looks like when you shoot it. Won't stabilize, won't do anything like that. So there's no trickery. What you see is what you get. So I'll make sure to include that somewhere within this overview, review, impressions, whatever you want to call this. Now, the Phantom 4 is a nice upgrade from the Phantom 3, but I will say right off the bat, if you are considering price as one of your main uh, goals or objectives to, to keep costs down, you definitely go with the Phantom 3. The upgrades you get with the Phantom 4 are nice, but they are not significant, in my opinion, in terms of image quality and flight control. The Phantom 4 gives you a few extra features in terms of safety, like sensors and whatnot, but the Phantom 3 is just as good in terms of image quality. So you want to save a little bit of money, go with the Phantom 3. There's a couple different models. You can look at that on your own time, but the Phantom 4 is nice for what you get. Obviously you have the drone itself with the camera and gimbal already attached, ready to go. Comes with one battery. You can buy an additional one, but I find that one usually gets the job done. This thing will last for about 30 minutes flight time. So that is a lot of time in the air. It's very rare that you would need more than that. And if you do need more than that, I'm sure that you know the occasion on when you would need to fly for longer than that. So you can get backups, but usually what I do is fly it for 30 minutes, put the battery on charge, and then come back later in the day to do additional shots when the sun has changed position or when something new and different is happening. If you need to be flying all day, get a few extra batteries. They're around like 160, I believe. So not terribly expensive, but probably not something you want to be spending money on because who really wants to buy batteries? Not very fun. Obviously you get a lot of different propellers. Um, there are silver ones because, and there are black ones because it does matter the orientation in which you put them on. And there are little dots on each mounting point telling you, okay, this is a black propeller spot. And then the ones without the dots are the silver spot. So keep that in mind. If you're trying to put a silver on a black, it won't work. Um, it does come with four, I believe, and maybe two spares. And you can buy an extra set of propellers if you're worried about breaking them for like 10 bucks just to have on hand. But unless you're, you know, plan doing something crazy where you think it's going to break, you'll probably be okay. I haven't crashed this thing yet fingers crossed. And although there have been a few close calls with other people, if you're flying it safely and responsibly, there's hardly any situation that I can imagine where you're really going to get in trouble. You know, things don't just come out of nowhere in the sky, aside from like a bird just going crazy and running into your drone. But I think the chances of that are pretty slim. Just be safe, be responsible, and you shouldn't run into any problems. You know, the, the horror stories you see online of people just running it you know, into, into people, it's because they're being stupid. They're not paying attention. They're doing something that's risky. Follow the rules, be safe, and you'll be okay. One thing I would recommend for this or any drone, uh, for that matter, any camera you're putting in the sky, usually you're going to be flying it in daylight because that's the law. You can't fly it at night unless you have special permission. And oftentimes you really wouldn't want to fly at night. I think most people want to fly during the day outside. Well, during the day when you're outside, there's a huge light in the sky. It's called the sun and it puts out enormous light. And so things get really, really bright. Get some ND filters. They make one specifically for the Phantom cameras and they are pretty inexpensive, maybe like 50 to hundred dollars, depending on how many you're getting in the quality, but get some ND filters, use them because, because the reason for that is you want to keep your shutter speed low. I imagine you're using this for video. If you're using it for photo, don't worry about it. You don't necessarily need the ND filters because you can always increase your shutter speed. But if you're shooting video and you want to follow that 180 degree, 180 degree shutter angle rule that I'm always talking about, you want to keep your shutter speed low, probably one over 60, one over 50, depending on the frame rate you're shooting, because that's, that's the key, right? The frame rate determines the shutter speed. So if you want to do that and you want to follow that rule to get that motion blur that you know you want, because that's what looks natural, you're going to need ND filters. They come in different strengths. There's ND4, ND6, ND16. You can find ND32s out there in higher and lower. But what I found is that ND8 and ND16 work really, really well during daylight hours. If you're if you're getting into sunset and you know dusk later afternoon, 
the light level might come down. If it's a really cloudy day, if it's a stormy day, those might be some considerations to make. But right off the bat, if you don't use an ND filter, expect to use a very, very high shutter speed, like one over 8,000. You know, even at the lowest ISO, you can go all the way down to ISO 100 and your shutter speed is still going to be cranked through the roof because this has a fixed aperture of 2.8. So if you have any kind of camera knowledge, you know that ISO 100 and 2.8 is still going to be really bright outside unless you have some kind of ND filter on there. So definitely invest in these. It took me a little while to invest in it because I was being lazy, but it has paid off quite handily because things just look nicer. They look more natural. They don't look quite so choppy and staccato. They have that nice motion blur that you want. The case that comes with the Phantom 4 is a little disappointing. It's this foam that's fairly rigid, but it, you know, it's not a Pelican case by any stretch of the imagination. I did paint mine black with some Plasti Dip because I thought that looked a little nicer than the awkwardly light gray that it comes in, but you don't need to do that. There are some other harder cases that you can buy online. I'll put some links to all this stuff down in the description below so it's easy to find, but you know, this standard case, as long as you treat it right, you're not going crazy with it, you'll probably be okay. There are some other, you know, wires, some charging stuff in here that you'll need, but it's nothing too interesting. These are kind of the main components and it sets up really fast. Getting the propellers on, getting up and running, you can be up and flying in five minutes. The one thing I don't like about the way DJI has gone about doing their drones, maybe a pro, maybe a con, is that you may have noticed that there's no way to monitor what the camera is seeing with this setup. You need to have your own smartphone and bring that to the table. Now, it does work with both iOS and Android, so most people nowadays will be fine. They can just put their phone right on here, but I don't really like that. I, I don't wanna have to worry about having low battery on my phone and then going to fly the drone and only have 10% battery life left. Uh, because as far as I can tell, this controller does not charge your phone. It hasn't charged mine anyway. So that is one downside that you have to use your phone. The light bridge technology of being able to monitor between the camera and the smartphone, it's incredible. It's amazing. The drone can be up in the sky hundreds of feet away and you're still able to see it on your smartphone. Works really, really well but you do have to supply your own smartphone. So if you're thinking about getting just some kind of phone or device just for the setup, you're gonna add in an additional $600, $800 potentially, depending on what you go with. There's probably some cheaper Android options out there as well. I don't really have much experience with those, so I can't speak to the quality of that. I've only used the iOS app on my iPhone. It's worked really well. The cool thing about the app is that because it's sending video signal directly from the camera, to the phone in real time, the phone will save all those clips on the phone at lower resolution than what you're shooting. So let's say you lost the drone, you would still have a backup version of the footage and it is nice if you wanna to edit together a quick highlight video or Instagram video or YouTube video directly on your phone. You don't have to copy the footage from the card to a computer and edit it that way. The DJI app actually does a pretty good job of handling all that for you. It's not as full featured as proper editing software, but in a pinch you can get something put together pretty quick. And I believe it also has live streaming capabilities. I don't know how often you would want to do that considering there's no audio coming from the Phantom 4, but hey, it's an option, you can do it. For recording on the Phantom 4, you're gonna need a micro SD card. I have a 64 gig card in here. That works quite well, a lot of time to record, almost always shooting 4K 30 on this thing. You can shoot higher frame rates at lower resolution, so if you wanna just do standard HD, I believe you can go up to 120 frames per second on this to get that slow motion look. But I often find that you don't really want that with aerial shots anyway, unless you're doing something that's really fast paced and moving potentially ocean waves or some kind of uh, firework explosion or something which you probably don't want to be filming near anyway but i'll leave that up to you to uh, break the law if you want or not but most of the time when i'm doing aerial shots things are already moving slow anyway if you think about it I, i've used this example before but if you're on an airplane and you look out the window things look like they're moving pretty slow. You don't feel like you're flying as fast as you are. Same thing, when you put this up in the air, a good distance away from people and buildings and objects, you can fly this very, very fast and it still looks 
very, very slow. Now that can get you into trouble because if you're only looking at the screen, it looks like you're moving slow, looks like you're moving small distances. And then when you look up in the air, you'll see that what, what was once way over here is now way over there. So always keep an eye on the drone itself, worry less about what you're recording and more about where it's at in the sky because the last thing you wanna do is fly into a building, fly into airspace that you don't intend to be in or lose track of it. Because at the end of the day, yes, the video that you're recording is really important, but it's more important that you don't get in trouble, hurt anybody or break the rules because that just leads to all kinds of disaster. If you can, definitely recommend you have some kind of spotter, somebody who can just keep an eye on the drone or somebody who can you know, fly it and look at the screen while you do, you do the same. Having another set of eyes is really helpful and keeps you out of trouble. As far as the actual image quality goes, I would say the 4K stuff out of this looks really good. There is a little bit of grain and noise and image quality compression that I'm not a huge fan of, but for the price of less than $2,000, I don't think you can get much better than this right now. Yes, you could fly bigger cameras with better sensors, but how much money do you actually want to put in the air? That's what it's come down to, to me. You know, you can fly a Red Epic, you can fly a GH4, you can fly a 5D. All these different cameras, there's different ways to put them in the air, but they all become really, really expensive. And the more expensive it is, that's more risk potentially out of your pocket, out of your wallet that you might not want to risk. For what you get out of this thing, I don't think anything else would beat it at the moment. It's really cheap for what you get, and the shots are spectacular. The gimbal works incredibly well. I've flown in winds that are a little bit rougher than you would like, and it still looks fantastic. You do a little bit extra stabilization if you need, but honestly, most times I don't even need to do that. And if you're shooting at 4K, the resolution you're gonna get is really good. At 1080, not quite as much of a fan, but if you know anything about me and you know my channel, you know that I don't always like to shoot 1080 anyway. I am a much bigger proponent of 4K just for image acquisition, you know, just to have it at 4K and scale it down in post-production. That's what I want. So that's why I would shoot 4K and it looks good. I would recommend going through some of the settings and turning down some of the picture profile settings, like turning down the sharpness, because oftentimes they, they overcompensate for the sharpness on a lot of these consumer grade cameras, which I would classify this as, and they turn that sharpness up too much and it just looks not quite right. Overly sharp, you get some weird artifacts. So turn that down. There are a few other videos out on the internet that I'd recommend where you go watch, learn the settings, learn how the menus work, but it really doesn't take much more than about 15 minutes to learn everything you need to know. And then obviously go out and look up the rules and regulations and what it takes to fly one of these because things are changing pretty quick and you can fly them you know, as a hobbyist and now soon for commercial with limited regulation from the FAA. In the past, it was a lot more difficult. It's moving towards the point where it's a little bit more open and friendly for people like you and me who want to use this for actual working. So do look at all that stuff. I find it, it's really, really valuable to research that kind of stuff. And then just look at all the little menu settings that I haven't had time to go into right now, but there are plenty of other videos out there on the internet talking about it. I just wanted to share my impressions and my personal experience having flown this now oh, close to 30 times probably uh, in the past, I'd say few months, fly it quite a bit and it works really well. It does exactly what I need, gives me the images that I want. It flies for the time that I want. It controls the way I want. I mean, this thing is so simple and so basic. People use the analogy all the time, like a kid can do it. Really, a kid can do it. You can't really mess it up unless you're doing something silly or crazy, like I said before. you know, If you're being dangerous, if you're being stupid, you're gonna get in trouble. Uh, and you're gonna have problems and you're gonna crash it and you're gonna lose it and all that stuff. But if you're just flying like a reasonable human being, I don't think you'll have too many issues. So definitely check the Phantom 4 out or potentially the Phantom 3 because like I said, they are very comparable and check out all the other stuff I talk about. I'm gonna put links to it down in the description below and if there's anything I didn't cover that you're wondering about, please feel free, leave a comment below. Happy to answer it for you.